Hey, look, I have it right there. See, it only works with arrays, so you have to create an array. Yeah. So I have to make one thing an array for a header? Yeah, well, your headers and your image would be elements of that array, and then use buffer.concat, and that'll concatenate two buffers instead of using string concatenation. String concatenation will get you in all kinds of trouble. <clears throat> Okay. Oh, I should keep forgetting to put this thing on. Okay, let's do this. So, uh, if anyone in the back, especially if you can't read this, if you can't see it, let me know. I can adjust. You know, I can make it bigger. Uh, I can put it into light mode if that's going to help. Uh, let me know uh, if you have trouble seeing it at all. So today is a demo day. I'm just going to give examples. We're going to hang out in the code all day. I have no slides for today or Friday. Friday will be showing you Docker, uh, building Docker con images and containers, and, uh, and showing you how to debug that process, how to work with that, just giving live demos of that. Uh, today we're going to kind of have a, a wide array of examples mostly focused on encoding and that big don't make your images strings uh, caveat, which, uh, which was the questions before lecture. Uh, a reminder, I'm in the Discord channel in lecture, so if you have questions, especially if you can't see, you might not want to raise your hand and be like, hey, I can't see it. Uh, just say, like, can you make it a little bigger? Switch to light mode if that'll help. It's hard for me to tell from up here, uh, especially the steep angles over here. It might be tough. Um, I mean, if... If you can't see that, you might want to you know, switch over. But, um, but let me know if there's anything on my end I can do to help. All right, so let's do this. If I want this up higher. Uh, so to start, I want to talk about encodings. I have this example here where we're going to check out some different characters and see how they work in UTF-8, how UTF-8 is encoded. So. We talked about this in the slides, but let's see it actually in practice. I have this function here. Let me just go through this and show what the, you know what, let me run it first. So you can see the output as I go through it. Characters. Oops. So I'm going to give this a string, x, and I have various strings that we're going to call this with to be able to see what this outputs, what this prints to the screen. And it's just going to print a whole bunch of information to the screen for us. And there's like one pixel for that resize. Uh, so first, I'm going to take that string and encode it as using UTF-8. So this is taking a string. That X is going to be a Python string, just the way I'm calling it. Uh, we don't have strong types, so we can't specify that. But this is going to be a Python string. And we want to say, convert this Python string into a sequence of bytes. Give me just the bytes that represent this string using the UTF-8 encoding. UTF-8 is ubiquitous across all languages, across all programs, across all software. It's a standard. So no matter what string I give it, what language I'm using, if I give it the same string, the same sequence of characters, the UTF-8 bytes are going to be exactly the same coming out on the other end. So x encoded is going to be bytes. Actually, I want to print out one more thing, because to be honest, I forget off the top of my head. Oh, I shouldn't do this live. Print uh, type of, I believe it is in Python, x encoded. And we'll get the type of that thing. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's a list of bytes, I want to say, but I could be wrong on that. So we're going to print the type. I think type of is JavaScript now that I think about it, but we'll get there by the end. If that's wrong, we'll get there. Let me comment that out because I'm pretty sure that's wrong. Um, first, I'm going to print out just the raw string, and I'm going to print out the string encoded. Now this, I'm converting it to a string. So of course, it's just going to be the actual string. Should see the same thing toy. Oh, actually, sorry. It does print out the bytes. Uh, I'm going to turn that byte array into a string and print it out. And it's going to show me the bytes of that. There's, there's often a lot of auto-encoding and decoding 
So sometimes we get tripped up on that, trying to show examples. Uh, this is giving me what I want, the actual bytes of that byte array. So each byte has two hex values. So the first byte is F0, then A9, B8, and BD. Those are the bytes for this specific character. Actually, let's start with the easiest one. Uh, this is the one I was thinking of. Uh, for ASCII, it will, a byte, if it's an ASCII character, a byte that represents an ASCII character, Python here is just auto-encoding it into the actual characters, and only when it's printed to the screen. These are actually stored as the bytes. We can see the byte, the B there. That means this is bytes, this is in, in bytes, but it's auto-decoding the ASCII only when it's printed to the screen. So when it's printed to the screen, it's trying to help us humans out and showing us what the actual characters are, because it just assumes that that's what we want to see. Once they're not ASCII characters, that's when we see the actual bytes, the raw bytes. So let's break this down even further. Let's iterate through that byte array. Oh, by the way, this, is, this lecture is prime for questions. If you have any questions, uh, this is to help you code your homework. So let me know if there are questions, if there's something else you want to see. Um, by all means, shout it out, and uh, we'll take a look. And hopefully I can do it on the fly. But if I can't, I can't. Uh, and then we'll do it Friday. So I want to iterate over the bytes of X encoded. X encoded is some, I'll just say some data structure, some sequential data structure of bytes. I know that for sure. Uh, whatever actual Python type it ends up being, um, less important. But it's some sequence of bytes that we can iterate over. So I'm going to iterate over the bytes in my variable P. I don't know why I named that P, uh, is going to be an individual byte. And we'll see each individual byte of this sequence of bytes. I'm just going to print to the screen. I'm going to use this end. This is just for formatting, so I can get the formatting the way I want. By default, print will end with a new line. If you don't want it to end with a new line, specify the end. I want this to have no uh, nothing at the end, no space. I want this to be space separated. So I'm printing out each one of these separated by spaces, and this actually gives me the decimal value. So a byte, it's like an int, but just eight bits. So uh, Python here is treating them like integers. We can add them using integer arithmetic, plus minus, you know, integer division, uh, multiplication. We can do all that stuff with bytes. And we got to think about overflows. Once we hit 255, if we add one, we're wrapping around back to zero. So keep that all in mind if you're trying to use these as, uh, as integers. But we can see the integer values by default. That's what Python's going to show us. If you print out an int to the screen, you don't want to see the bytes in most cases. Uh, you want to see the actual integer value. So that's what we're getting here. And we just print these things to the screen. If that's not what we're interested in, we can convert them to hex values and then print the hex strings to the screen. So that's the next thing we see. We'll see the hex, 0x, whenever you see that, you know the number that follows is a hex string. For example, if we have 1, 1 in hex, how do you know if that's 11? How do you know if that's 3 in binary? Or how do you know if that's 9 in hex? Uh, it's hard to tell that. So if we lead this with a 0x, or as we'll see in a minute, 0b if it's in binary, that's going to tell us what base this is being printed in. 0x, that's printed in hex. So we know that 0x68 is a hex 6 and a hex 8, which is going to be 104 in decimal. Uh, these will map exactly to the ASCII chart. If you pull up your ASCII chart, uh, you can confirm that this uh, hex 68 is a lowercase h, hex 65 is a lowercase e, et cetera, et cetera. And finally, I'm going to print these out one more time, but this time converting to binary strings instead of hex strings. In binary, we see the same thing. We can confirm that the, this value in binary, this value in hex, this value in base 10, these are all the same values. Uh, and they all represent a lowercase h in the ASCII chart. So if we look at the binary, these have leading zeros. This is seven bits here. Leading zeros are truncated just for the formatting when it's printed to the screen. There is a leading zero there, uh, but when it's printed to the screen, it just doesn't print the leading zero. Just like 
Uh, bad example with these, but if we had one of these that was like 98, it's not going to be 0, 098. Uh, that's just not natural. Uh, it carries the same thing to binary. I kind of would like to see the leading zeros in binary, but by default, the leading zeros are not there. So if you want the leading zeros, you'd have to do some extra work to get them. Uh, when we do uh, web sockets, I do the extra work to print out the leading zeros because it helps everything align, but uh, we don't need that quite yet. But there are leading zeros here, so these are all 7-bit values being printed, representing, you know, uh, 0, 1, 1, 0 would be, uh, in binary would be 6. So we have that hex 6, and then the 8 to get the 104. And the important thing, this is the big thing that we need to know. I'm going to print out the length of the string. I mean, all that we need to know, that's just showing you know, what we've seen in the slides last time. You can actually play with this in your code. Uh, the next thing, printing out the length of the string and the length of the byte array representing that string is going to be important to getting your correct content length in your server. To get the right content length, you need the number of bytes for that string, or the number of bytes in general, the number of bytes of information in the body of your response. Has to be number of bytes. String length is not going to cut it. Sometimes these are the same. These ASCII characters are all one byte each. They only take seven bits with a leading zero when they're encoded with UTF-8. Uh, there is, are leading zeros here, but just because we can't have a 7-bit byte, it doesn't make sense. Um, but the string length and the byte length are the same because each character in the string is one single byte in the byte array. But the rest of these characters, ooh, these are non-ASCII. You're not going to find these in any ASCII chart. Uh, these characters do not fall into those 128 characters in ASCII. So we need more ways to represent them. Of course, we know the answer is UTF-8. And we know that UTF-8 is a multi-byte encoding for non-ASCII characters. So when we get to the symbol, the character one quarter, when we convert it, when we print it out, when we, uh, when we encode it with UTF-8, and then tear this out apart and look at what it actually is, we can tell that this is two bytes. This is definitely a two-byte character when it's encoded in UTF-8. So, and we can see it's going to follow the structure that we saw last time. 110 is our first byte. Our first byte leads with 110. So we know that this is a two-byte character, and each subsequent byte is going to start with 10. So this sequence in binary, if that flies across the internet, and your content type is text and encoded with UTF-8. The other end knows that this is the one quarter character. Because it's going to read these two bytes. It's going to read the first byte, realize it's two bytes, read the second byte, look them up in some chart, you know, uh, some data structure, however, uh, uh, however they're storing their UTF-8 in the machine, and looking up this character and getting this character. String length one, byte length two. So if you want to send this percent sign over the internet and you're getting your content length using the length of the string, it's wrong, it's not going to send right. You're not going to get the right information on the other side. Uh, the browser will only read the first byte and then it's going to get a UTF-8 encoding error or decoding error and you're going to see one of them boxes. If you're lucky, the thing might just crash. But you're going to see one of them boxes when you see those squares or rectangles all over a page. Those are UTF-8 encoding or uh, decoding errors. The bytes, we were told it was encoded with UTF-8, but it wasn't proper UTF-8. We can't decode just this single byte into any character. It doesn't map to any character in UTF-8. So we get a decoding error. Don't know what to do. Just, just print some box or something to show the user that something went wrong. If we have multiple characters, we're just going to get multiple uh, more bytes. This is a, a little, uh, a little. What do I want to say? Convoluted, I guess. Uh, on the first line, because the space, it's a proper ASCII byte, so the uh, so Python just printed out a space character. 
it said, hey, this byte looks like an ASCII character. It looks like a space, and we'll print a space. Uh, but once we get into printing out the actual values, we see we get the 32, which will map to a, a blank space in ASCII. We get 194, 188, which is going to be our, percent, uh, our one quarter sign that we saw earlier. Then this euro symbol is going to be a three byte character. So our first byte for the, per, uh, for the euro symbol, 1110. So we know this is a three byte character. And two bytes that both start with one zero, the continuation bytes. So other than those bits that I just highlighted, all the other information is the actual character code. And that's what will get looked up in the chart to be able to figure out what character it is, what specific character it is. String length is three here, byte length six. If you have a lot of non-English text and you're taking string length, I mean, you could have half, your content length being half of the actual bytes that you're sending. You're only gonna get like half of your content sometimes. Or for our last example, you might get a quarter of your content. This is a four byte character. Oops, that's a three byte character. This is another three byte character. Uh, this is a, a four byte character. We have one, 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 zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero. Four bytes for one character. If you have a lot of four byte characters on your website and you're saying, oh yeah, content length string, uh, the length of the string, you're only gonna have a quarter of your text appearing on the screen. You're gonna be wondering what happens, what happened there. And the last character is likely to have a decoding error. So you're gonna have a quarter of your text and then a rectangle and then nothing else. Uh, you're going to be hopefully remembering back to today and Monday's lecture and going, oh yeah, byte length, not string length. And then you'll have your byte length as the content length, and then you'll be fine after that. All right. Any questions so far? I have a certain amount of prepared examples, and then I want to do some live coding, but I want to know what I should live code. Uh, what everybody's struggling with on the homework assignment. Or maybe you're all done with the homework assignment. I don't know. <laughs> I know some of you are. So, uh, But anything that somebody's struggling with. Or uh, I have some examples in Node, and I'm doing Python right now, obviously. Um, but I don't, until homework one, I don't know what everybody's using for a language. So if there's another language that a lot of you are using, I'd like to know about that too, and I can try to, on the fly, come up with some examples. Uh, I did show some Scala earlier. Maybe I'll jump back to Scala today and do some UTF-8 in Scala. Maybe, yeah. So could we, um, if our, whatever we use in our language to send an image, mm -hmm. could we make our entire response that same type and just send that type? Or mm -hmm. should we do the concatenation? Your, so when you send the image, the entire body of the response is going to be only that image, only the bytes of that image. Is that your question? Right. Yeah, but like, because when in Node you can have the whole thing's a buffer. Yeah. So you're sending over a buffer, and the browser is able to interpret that. So should so, all of our responses be buffers? Yeah. So buffers in JavaScript is a byte sequence. Okay. So when you send that over the wire, it's just a sequence of bytes. Uh, so that's what we want to work with in Node, is buffers. Okay, so instead of having like the hello text plane, um, like the whole thing just being a string, it should be a buffer. So your headers will still be a string, but then you'll do buffer.from and convert the string into a buffer, and then you do buffer. You know, read your image as a buffer, yeah. and then concatenate those two buffers, and then send them all in bytes. But, uh, and we'll do, I have an image example as well. But the images you want to work with in bytes. So that means your string, whatever language you're working in, your string, your headers are going to be a string. Your image is going to be some sequence of bytes, whatever data structure your language uses. And then you have to concatenate those two uh, sequence of bytes, sequences of bytes in the world of bytes, not in the world of strings. That's the most common way of messing up your image is accidentally converting your image into a string and then back into bytes. Uh, it, I know I said in lecture, I know all of you know, I'm not gonna convert my image to a string, but it's very easy to do on accident. That's the big issue that we have. It's easy to do on accident. Uh, and it's tough to know 
okay, I have this array of, you know, this data structure of bytes for my image, but I also have to combine it with the strings. Figuring out exactly how to do that in your language can be a little tricky too. Yes? Do you have any like tips when using Scholar and IntelliJ for the sum or like a quality of life type practice? Uh, I th for Scala, I think Scala is actually, uh, Scala actually takes care of a lot of this in a really clean way. I, I don't have any tips off the top of my head, but Scala works in bytes, I think, pretty naturally. Maybe maybe I'm just uh, biased because I've been using Scala in 116 so long. Um, like when you get the data, it's in a nice, uh, let me rephrase this. I think uh, because it's strongly typed, it really helps out. Uh, it's very hard to accidentally convert something into a string in Scala. You just can't really do that. Uh, it's not going to let you make that mistake. Uh, so in that sense, it's easier uh, because it forces you to keep track of your types. In loosely typed languages like JavaScript and Python, it's really easy to just accidentally convert something into a different type because you don't have any types. Um, but specific tips, not off the top of my head. Um, but I can jump to, I might jump to Scala by the end of today. If I think of something, I'll point it out. Yep. Yeah, the HTML, CSS, and JavaScript are three different responses. So your HTML has those, Im those other files linked. And when the browser gets the HTML, it's going to look at those links and then send three more requests, or two more, three more with the image. It's going to send more requests. So your server, when it gets a request for the HTML, it says, okay, I got a request for the HTML, I'm sending the HTML. You don't think ahead at all. You don't think, oh, this user's also going to need my CSS JavaScript in this picture of a flamingo. You don't think ahead like that. You just have, if they're requesting the HTML, send the HTML. If they're requesting the CSS, send the CSS. If they're requesting the JavaScript, send the JavaScript. If they're requesting an image, send whatever image they're requesting. And that's it. And then the browser is going to send four separate requests, and the browser is going to handle that end. But you set, handle each request separately. Any advice for avoiding the big conditional box? Um, <laughs> it, it's, it is tricky. I, do, I know I recommend doing it, but it is pretty tricky to set up. Uh, the best advice I can give is use functional programming. In, uh, in regular expressions and say, if this regular expression matches the path that was requested, then call this function to be able to get the return value or the, the response. Uh, so if you can set that up, if you know both, uh, you should know functional programming. I think you all saw that in 1.16. Uh, so remembering functional programming and then, jeez, uh, 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 <laughs> regular expressions. Uh, regular expressions. I don't know if we really specifically teach those in a class anymore after they've been dropped, uh, after 396 has been dropped from being required. Uh, we used to talk about them in there. Um, so that one's a little tricky. You might have to look that up. Uh, and at the very least, so the regular expressions come into play when you're serving specific images. Somebody, something starts with slash images, then call this function. Uh, so you might be able to do that without regular expressions um, or read up regular expression libraries and figure out how to get that going. Once you get that going, set up your server to be able to take a request type and a path, either as a string or a regex, if you're getting your regex on, or even a function. You could probably do it as a function that returns a Boolean. And then the function that actually uh, assembles the response. And then we, for your server, you'll do server dot, you know, add whatever you call your method, add request type path string and then function to call. And that'll get rid of your big if block. And then you have one loop that loops through all of the functions that you added with that method and check, does the type in the path, the request type in the path match what was given? That's where you do your regex matching if you're using regex. If so, call that function. And wherever that function returns, that's what I'm sending back to the user. Uh, so that's how I would get rid of that big if else block. If that's a bit much, if you're not quite ready to tackle that, you know, You'll get through, you'll survive with the big if, else if, else if, else if, else if. Uh, it's, it's just tough to maintain, especially when you get to the later homeworks. It's a big mess of, of stuff.
you go over sending the HTML files to the client, open their requests. Um, maybe, let me, let me circle back to that one if there's time. Uh, sending the HTML will be like if, uh, if request type equals get and the path equals slash, then you're going to send the HTML. Or do you mean the, oh, I think I know what you're saying. Actually sending the file. Yeah, I, I can talk about that in a second. I'm about to talk into, I'm about to transition into some file I.O. stuff. Uh, so I can lump that in there. HTML, send the HTML, CSS, and JavaScript is similar to the image, but it's a lot simpler because if you convert it to a string, that's fine because it's a string. Like all the tech, the content of those files is just a string. Uh, so if you convert it to a string and just concatenate it to your headers, that's fine. Uh, the image is where it gets a bit trickier because you have to work in bytes. You can keep your HTML, CSS, and JavaScript in bytes and do the same thing you do as you do for images as well. But, um, do we have access to these? No, I don't post these examples. Uh, I, I did once, and then I just see them cut and paste in every homework submission. And then everybody chooses the language that I show the most examples in, and it's just really frustrating. You can still watch the videos and type them up, but you got to type them up yourself. Um, and I missed one here. The uh, uh, for when the browser is requesting the JavaScript, CSS, etc. The what's going to change is the path in the request line of the request. So that very first line that you read, they're all going to be GET requests. They're all going to be HTTP 1.1 uh, at for this homework anyway. They'll all be GET requests. And then the middle value, the path, it's either going to be slash if they're looking for the HTML. It's going to be style.css if they're asking for the CSS, functions.js if they're looking for the JavaScript, image slash flamingo if they're looking for the image of the flamingo, et cetera. Uh, so that path is how you're deciding what to respond with. All right, uh, and just to just kind of show a little more what's going on, this works. I'm going to take hello, the string. I'm going to encode it using ASCII, and I'm going to decode it using UTF-8. This works because ASCII, uh, ASCII is a subset of UTF-8. So anything that's proper ASCII is also proper UTF-8. And that part we don't need to talk about yet. This is, uh, this is an example when we get to WebSockets. That will become more important, bit masking. Yep. This is a curious question. I know it's not something you should do, but could you do the inverse? Like, let's say you use UTF-8, but it would be something that is an ASCII value, and then decode it in ASCII. Let's try it. I'm confident it'll work, but that's why I like being, having the live examples here. You don't have to take my word for it. Uh, right here. Because encoding in, U if it's ASCII only, encoding in UTF-8 or ASCII, it's going to give me the same exact byte sequence. Like a, or up here, we could change this to ASCII. And we're going to get the same exact byte sequence for hello. Hello worked perfectly fine because that's all ASCII. And once we got to the second character, that one quarter sign, it said, uh, we, I don't know what to do with this. This is not ASCII. What are you even trying to do here? And then it just crashes. But if it's ASCII only, UTF-8 and ASCII are interchangeable. Oh, let's see. I'm pretty sure type of is wrong, but. Is it class? I'm not going to sit here and guess. But, yeah. But following that, is there, it seems like it just makes sense to always use UTF-8. Is there any time there's a scenario that we would want to use ASCII over UTF-8? Is there any, so the question is, is there any time we would want to use ASCII over UTF-8? Yes, actually, or actually, can I even say that? Be, yeah, it'd be tough to, to think of a, a case. Um, these days, yeah, you should just use UTF-8 for everything. The one thing I was going to say, but I, I, it would have been wrong, is the headers of your HTTP requests that you're getting have to be ASCII only. That's the only thing that complies with the standard. Um, but if you hit it with UTF-8, it's not going to hurt it. As long as you're not using UTF-8 only characters when you send your response in the headers, uh, you can still encode it with UTF-8. It's just going to be ASCII. Uh, so ASCII is pretty outdated these days, you're right.
Uh, but the nice thing about UTF-8 is it's backward compatible. All that stuff that's been written in ASCII, it all still works. That's what's really nice about UTF-8. One nice thing, for at least for us in uh, English-speaking countries. All right, so let's talk about files. So I have this quick example. You know, if I can get it aligned the way I want. I have this quick example, again in Python, where I just want to copy a file. Uh, not something you necessarily have to do for your servers, but just as a proof of concept of you know, showing how we're going to read a file and work with those files. So the big thing here is I want to read in binary mode. Each language is going to have some way of specifying this. This is pretty ubiquitous syntax. Uh, I'm going to open this in read only mode in binary. So I'm going to read this in binary. If I don't specify that, some languages, Python, well, I'm almost positive Python included, but we can just run it and find out. Uh, will default to reading the file as a string. We don't want to read it as a string because this is an image. For your HTML, CSS, JavaScript, you can get away with reading it as a string. That's perfectly fine. Then use string concatenation to concatenate it with your headers and then ship it across the wire. That's perfectly fine. That's just like sending your HTML, CSS, and JavaScript is just like your slash hello in objective one. You're just sending a string. The only difference is you're getting that string by reading a file instead of just typing hello. That's the only difference. You read the file, you convert that file to a string if you want, concatenate the string, convert that to a byte sequence, and then ship it. That's perfectly fine. That's perfectly acceptable. When we get to the image, we have to make sure we're reading the bytes of the image. If we try to read this as a string, we're going to get in trouble. So let me first delete this. Don't ask me again. I'm sure. So I have this image, a PNG. And I want to copy that into a new file named copy.png. I'm going to, you know, hopefully this is, is nothing new. This is since 1.15 you've been doing this stuff. Uh, but I'm going to open the file. I'm going to read the bytes of the file. This is going to read all the entirety of the file. So now I have B, which is a byte sequence containing all of the bytes of that file. And then I'm going to write, I'm going to open another file in write mode in binary and just write all of B, all of the contents to that second file. If I run this, oops, I was in the right directory. I have it all in the encoding directory. If we run this, once the editor catches up, I'll have an exact copy of that image. So let's go back to that and see what happens if we don't do this the right way, if we do it this way, where instead of just reading the bytes and storing the bytes, I'm going to convert that to a string. This is where we might accidentally convert our image to a string. And what's Python going to do? actually expected it to do something different. Um, but our image is definitely broken. So once we convert it, I thought Python crashed there. Maybe the latest version of Python doesn't crash anymore. Uh, I thought it crashed with a UTF-8 decoding error. But uh, we definitely didn't get our image for sure. That's never going to happen. We're never going to get our image by doing this. Because when we tried to decode the bytes of this file using UTF-8, UTF-8 is the default decoding for, uh, for Python, so when I say str, this, these bytes, it's trying to use UTF-8 to decode those bytes. Well, those bytes are not UTF-8 encoded. They're not proper UTF-8. So it doesn't know what to do. It doesn't know how to come up with a string. I'm surprised it even did anything. What did we even get here? Bunch of bytes. Some of them are ASCII, of course. Uh, you must have just guessed and just tried to encode that using UTF-8. But anyway, we certainly are never going to get our image doing that. 
unless by some absolute miracle our image happened to be a proper UTF-8 string, uh, a sequence of bytes, which would be just astronomical odds. It's not going to happen. Uh, so we didn't get our file. Uh, and I want to check, if I just read this like this, go back to copy file. Yeah, th this is what I expected, this decoding error. Uh, so if I just read it in read mode, UTF-8 encoding error, can't decode it, uh, doesn't work. I'm, surprised, I'm still wondering now why the other one worked. That shouldn't have worked. Should, I would expect that to give me the same error. Uh, and certainly we're not going to get our image still. Our image is still broken. Until we fix this, this little B, it's one of them office hour questions where you kick yourself, I was hours working on that and all you did was add a B, uh, and then the image works. Yes. I know later on we're going to go. We're going to upload files to our, our web page. Mm -hmm. um, when we do that, is there like a way to limit the amount of files inputted? And also, is there like if multiple users are trying to upload a file at the same time, is that something we need to handle? Uh, the, multiple users uploading images at the same time is not something you have to handle. Uh, the limiting the number of images that are uploaded, like the total number of images. Uh, my, my answer is you can do anything. Anything you can code, you can do. So you can have some counter that increments and then say if that counter over some value, you know, just don't allow uploads anymore. Certainly something we can do. It's not something you have to do for the homework, though. Okay. Uh, but yeah, if somebody tries to DOS your server, send a, a million images with a script, yeah, it's something you might want to prevent from. And are we using a particular database for it? Uh, not for that assignment. Uh, but for homework three, you will start using a database. Okay. There's enough to worry about in homework two. Homework two is it's, it's where things get real. Uh, so I don't want to add anything more, anything too much to that. Uh, image uploads is it's where you, uh, so homework two, the, the overview of it is users have to be able to upload images to your server, and you have to host those images for other users and have a page where you can see all the uploaded images. Uh, which is no small feat when you're starting with just a TCP socket. It's um, so uh, yeah. I don't want to add a database into that one. Uh, let me jump over to JavaScript. We've hung out in Python for long enough. I don't have too much um, JavaScript here. Uh, I don't have too much JavaScript here. This this is part of a different example. I'll delete it for now. But in JavaScript, you're going to have to use these buffers, which you heard us talking about earlier. Everything has to be uh, a buffer, which is Java's byte sequence. I believe buffer.from returns. Let me see if I can figure out real quick. It, it does return a buffer type. Okay. Uh, so that's going to return the buffer that is the byte sequence, or at least contains the byte sequence with some extra functionality on top of it. So x is going to be a byte sequence for hello. And I have my character here, which is a byte sequence in y. If I look at y.length, I get the number of bytes for that. I'm getting the number of bytes. So when I want to formulate my response in JavaScript, in Node, especially when I have the images for objective 5, I want to get the image as a buffer and just get the bytes of that image. And then I want to take my headers. This will be, you know, uh, HTTP 1.1, OK, oops, 200 OK, slash R slash N. Uh, yeah, thank you. Content type. image JPEG and always our trailing slash r slash n slash r slash n. Uh, so this would be these would be my headers and say these are we'll just have use some imagination here. These are the bytes of our image. We need to concatenate the headers which are a string with some bytes that represent our image. 
So we cannot do that in the world of strings. If we do that, Stop, stop, stop. I, I keep trying to use, uh, I don't want to use the STR explicitly, though, because I just want to, I lost a, a print. I keep using IntelliJ keyboard shortcuts is where I keep getting in trouble there. Uh, and you know what? Let's do it without the dot length as well. Just to see what we get. I'm not sure what we get in this one. Uh, so we have, we might get everything just because this is a string. Let me, now let's just, let's just keep going with this. Uh, so we can see the length. Yeah, because that's a proper string, so it's going to be fine. But when we concatenate these, whenever we do plus here, Oh, this does show my point, at least. So whenever we do plus here, so this is the concatenated response. This is our full response, uh, where you would take the length and then splice that into the content length up there. Um, what am I doing? Let me do this. Let me just do the full example. I'm trying to uh, half-ass something there. So content length. Uh, slide at length. Let's do this in the right order here. these down here as well. So I'm going to create a buffer. Whatever the content is, which will be an image for objective 5, this is where this really comes into play, uh, and objective 4 where you're getting the right content length. But I want to create this as a buffer, not a string, when I get its length. If I do just this character, that length, because here I got content length 4, that's what I want. It's a 4 byte, four byte character. If I just do the length of that, which somehow gave me 2. I expect that to give me 1, but you know what, whatever. It's wrong. We know that much. We want to get the right content length there. So now I got content length 4. It's a 4 byte character. And that's how I'm getting the right length. I convert it to a byte sequence, a buffer in this case, and then get the length of it. Do not get the length of it as a string. You'll get the wrong content length. Splice that length in there. And then, especially when it comes to images, you want to concatenate as buffers. You're doing everything in the world of buffers, in the world of byte arrays. That's when you're concatenating these buffers. In JavaScript, we have buffer.concat, which will combine two buffers which takes an array, so put whatever you want to concatenate into an array, concatenate them, and then I'm getting the length here, but this is where this right here is what you would send over the wire. That's what you send back to the client. You concatenate your headers as a buffer with your image as a buffer, and then send that back to the client. I mean, why doesn't that work? Why doesn't it work? It doesn't work. Oh, I, I don't know. I, <laughs> just use concat. Because you know? yeah. uh, it seems like that would work, but I don't know. Uh, off the top of my head. Uh, but we can see right here, this is the big, uh, this is the big trick, or the, the big mistake that you know, some of you would probably still make, is I have to concatenate in the world of buffers, but I'm going to be tempted to just say x plus y. 
whenever you, when you do x plus y, JavaScript is converting these, or Node is converting these into strings and then using string concatenation. So we can see our content length is wrong here. Uh, we can print out the bytes and eyeball the bytes and see that they're off. But we know that our length is off. With 65, we lost those two bytes, which are part of the UTF-8 string here. Because we used string concatenation, that's more of a proof of concept that this is using string concatenation. Now we're taking the length of a string. We no longer have a buffer because this used string concatenation and auto-converted to strings. With these loosely typed languages, it's easy to, to accidentally convert your types into different types. We don't have a buffer anymore here. We could convert it back into a buffer like this and get the proper string. But if Y was your image, you just converted your image to a string and then back to a byte array. And as we know, that's going to destroy your image. So this works when it's a UTF-8, when it's just text. This will work for uh, objective four. But once you get to five and you're reading images, things are going to break. You can't convert those images into strings. It's very easy to do accidentally. You had a question? Okay. Anything else? Anything somebody's tripped up on on the homework that today didn't help? Anything else I can try to demo on the fly? I want to answer all the office hours questions today, today and Friday. Yes. Yeah, uh, that's what I recommend. If you're if you want to get rid of that big if else if else if block, uh, I would use regular expressions with functional programming. There are other ways to do it, but that's the way I, uh, I would approach it. I think it's built in, but I'm not 100% on that. It's definitely built into language, but you might have to have an import line at the top. It might be, it might be like uh, require RE, I think it is. Maybe I'm thinking of Python. I don't know. I get things mixed up a lot these days. Uh, especially like this, uh, switching between languages and then having uh, Scala on deck, one lecture with three languages. <laughs> it's uh, I get all the syntax mixed up all the time. Yeah, no problem. Uh, if, if anybody thinks of our question, we do have a question. Uh, yeah, so the end here, what I was doing here isn't really something you want to do. I'm doing this as a proof of concept. You'll, you'd never need the length of the entire response. You never need the length including the headers. You always want the length of just the body. So the content length here is four. You never have to compute this. I'm, I was just doing this to show as uh, you know, the simplest way I could think of to show that this is converting to a string because our lengths are wrong. This is the length of a string, and this is the length of number of bytes, the length of the byte array. Uh, so that's not something you have to do. You never need to know the length of the entire response, including headers. I'm just doing that as an example. Yes? Is there a maximum content length? Like, is this yeah. Like Maximum content length? No. no. Uh, there is a maximum length to the headers. Like if your headers are too big, uh, and I, by the way, does anybody else get this? I get this all the time on the hub. I keep getting requests, uh, requests too large because it has this uh, several K size cookie that it puts in the headers, and I actually exceed that, uh, the header length. I don't know why it does it to me. I don't know. I haven't heard anybody else complain about that. I have to delete my cookies and then try it again. Do you have that? Did you? All right, I'm not the only one. I have company. Uh, I, I've only seen it in Opera. When I switch to Chrome, I don't see that. So it might be something with the browser. Or are you using Opera by chance? Okay. So so it must, it must be a bigger problem then. Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know. The drives are nuts. If you see that and you don't know what to do, clear your cookies or at least delete that huge one uh, and then send the request again. Uh, but yeah, we're, we're out of time anyway. So if you have more questions, hit me on the, the Discord or something. So I give me a heads up so I can prepare some lecture content if you want to see it in lecture. Other than that, I'll see you Friday.